So, how many of you guys have seen Remember the Titans? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty great movie. Have you ever seen it? I would suggest you go watch it pretty soon. It's a great, great movie. Um, so as a filmmaker, um, I really enjoy watching films um, because they have a way of telling stories um, that are very unique and that can really grip our hearts and, and really pull out some really deep emotions from us. Um, and this particular film, uh, I thought it was just very relevant. Um, as well as from then, I think it's very relevant now for just um, a lot of what we're seeing in today's society. Um, and in this particular film, you know, they're dealing with racism um, and division. And, and, and that's just a, a product of sin. I think we all know that. Um, and there are tons of other things in this world that are dividing us other than the color of our skin. There's political systems, there's, there's uh, team sports, there's um, social economic statuses, all those different things um, are things that divide us. And all this film, because of the redemption that comes out of it, um, in this scene, Denzel Washington, Coach Boone's character is talking to these students um, who are supposed to be a team, but at this, at this point in time, they aren't actually a team at all. They're kind of fighting and bickering and challenging each other and falling apart and falling to pieces. And he realizes that something has to change, that if they don't come together for a common good, for a single purpose, that they're going to fail. That there's, there won't be a season, there won't be a team, that they're going to destroy themselves just like their ancestors did. What he was wanting to do was, was wanting to unite them. Unite them for, for a cause, unite them for a mission, unite them for their own sakes, to save them from destruction, you know? Um, and so I think it's a very relevant thing even for today. As we look into in today's world, there's so many different things that are wanting to vie for our attention, wanting to pull us away um, from where we are and conform to, to this and that, you know? There's voices everywhere. Yeah, voices everywhere. But the good thing about this film is that these, these young men, they get it. They, they eventually wake up. There's a scene where, uh, where Bert's here and um, Julius, they're like, strong side, left side, strong side, left side. And they're hitting each other, and it's a turning point for the entire team. And they see that these two leaders are actually starting to click, and they're coming together. And they realize that this guy's not so bad. You know, he may look a little different, but like, this guy's a bad person. I need to treat him like a person. Uh, and then they go through the season and start winning games and, and, and it impact it's, it's, it's a redeeming thing and they win and they, and they overcome all the challenges uh, of society, all the people telling them that they shouldn't be around each other, that they need to separate. Uh, and it's a redeeming end to it. And Coach Boone, and, you know, this is based off of, off of a true story, uh, which, is, which, makes, which makes it even so much more cool. It's based on a true story. Um, but before there was a Coach Boone preaching this message to this team um, by union, there's someone who came before him a couple thousand years, a couple thousand years before, named Jesus. It's a very similar message, um, wanting people to unite. But his his definition of his way of uniting is different than than what we kind of see it as. And what similar to Coach Boone's, but it, it's a lot deeper. And I think I want to talk about that tonight. And talk about what it means to be in unity, what it means to unite together. And so, if you guys want to open your Bibles up with me to John 17, that'd be great. And it should be a good this um, It's a lot to read, so just bear with me. Um, I'm actually going to start at verse 6. So, I'll start there. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I give them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and that they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, 
so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them to the world. For, they, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them, is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, as we are one. I in them, and you in me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. And that's why I'll, I'll stop there. So to kind of put in context where we are in this passage, this is towards the end of Jesus' life on earth. Um, this just, it just finished this huge festival, and he had the last supper with the disciples, and he washed his feet, and now he's, now he's telling them, kind of preparing them, giving them this, this speech to prepare them for what's going to come next. This is before the crucifixion, like right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and faces all of this heavy stuff, right? Um, but, but what's really cool about this is a couple of things. This is Jesus, this is Jesus praying. This is a prayer that he prayed. And when I think about that, I think, wow, like Jesus, before he died, he took the time to pray, not for himself, but, but for you and for me. This tells you right here that Jesus cares about us, that he cares about you, that he cares about me. Uh, that he was a man full of, full of just selfless honor. Um, and so I love reading this passage because it just gives me hope and it gives me just this, just this information that, that God really does want us to, to succeed. And one thing I want to point out that he says it here, and I think it's really, really important, he says, in 15, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. When I read that thing, you know, I think, I think Jesus wants us to give for the reason. That's what that tells me. He's, he's not telling God, God, take him out, like, get him out of there. Like, he's like, God, like, keep him there, but I'll protect him. Because there's a purpose. When he's standing up here, there's a purpose for us. That there's something he wants, us to, wants for us to accomplish. So he's praying, God, in this mission, with what's going to happen next after I go, keep him here because I'm, I'm going to protect him. I'm going to protect him. And then we go further, we see, um, we kind of see what, he, what he's really talking about. In verse uh, 20, 21, he says, That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they, all, may they also be in us so that the Lord may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And that's kind of like the climax of this prayer of, of Jesus praying. Like Jesus, he says, Father, I want them to be in complete unity. I want them to unite as a body so that the world know who I am. But there's a catch to it. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen like that. You know, like people can be united, but they can be united in the wrong ways. They can be united for the wrong reasons, right? So, but Jesus has specific instructions before he says, before he asks for all of us to be united, he says, Father, pray that they will be united with us. That they will be united with you and me. Yeah, turn one. Father, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. So the key to being united with, like, together is actually first being united with Jesus. Being one with Christ. Not being aligned, not, like, being close, but, like, being completely consumed and, like, interconnected with Jesus. You know? I feel like a lot of us want to be like Jesus, but how many of us want to be unified with Jesus? 
I completely overtaken with it, you know? And, you know, it's a good thought, but it's, it's, it's harder than anything. It's, it's harder than anything, you know? Like, being unified with someone can be very challenging. That's what Jesus is asking for. If you want to be united and together as a body for the world to know who he is at first, that you must do, be completely united with him and the Father. Now, how do we do that? That's the question, okay? So we're going to start answering those questions. Um, was, Jesus gives, he gives us answers to these questions, like in this passage of, of prayer, and even like before he even gets to this prayer, he, he does things to kind of set up what he's saying. Um, so the first thing that that we need to do to find ourselves in the position to unite with Jesus is give up control. We have to submit to him. And, and by that, I mean we have to put down our pride and, and pick up humility. Because here's the thing, a lot of us think we have everything figured out. You know, we're kind of brought up to kind of have a plan, you know, graduate high school, go to college, and then go get this job and do these things, you know, and, and those things are okay things, but unfortunately, a lot of us think we know more than, than what we actually do. And I, I found out very quickly when I got to college that I didn't know so much stuff I did. It took me six years to finish. I went to three different colleges. I changed majors like three times. <laughs> and, and, you know, we find ourselves with the desire to just walk into something and just, and just get it done, but it's so much harder than that. You know, life is so complicated and so confusing, especially right now, with the coronavirus thing. Everyone thought they knew what to do. We did. <laughs> everyone kept getting their virus. Like, every, like, the United States, we were not ready at all. And we tried implementing so many different things, and these things keep falling apart. These systems that we keep building keep collapsing. Because they, they're not being approached correctly. Um, and so, you know, one way to know that, that you kind of have like this kind of prideful mentality is, is, to, is to, in your spirit, it's like this, ask yourself, like look, look at yourself and examine yourself. And, and if, you, if you find yourself being very critical about things a lot, then that's one way to know that, that you kind of have this kind of this pride mentality in you. If you're very quick to be uh, critical and kind of like on top of things other people, other people are, are doing, and that may be you, or if you find fault in everything else but yourself, you know, that it could be you as well. Um, and that's hard um, to deal with. And, and one, one person that, that, that makes a great example of this is, is, is Peter. Um, you know, Peter was the first, one of the first disciples that Jesus called off the boat. He called all these fish. And then Jesus caused Peter the rock on which the church would be built, and the gates of, of hell would not be built against it. And then Peter walks on water, and so Peter's kind of like this superstar, kind of among the um, among the disciples. And you know, later on, like after after like after this prayer, Jesus, I mean, Peter cuts off some guys here. So Peter, you know, thinks he's, he's he thinks pretty highly of himself. Um, he thinks that that he really is united with Jesus. But, but then he's tested. Um, so what happens is this. Well, we all know the story. Um, Jesus tells Peter that, that he would deny him three times for the rooster crow. And, and Peter said, no, I would never do that. I would never betray you. Jesus, I love you. I know you. I know you. I've walked with you for so long. I would never betray you. And then Jesus is taken by the, the Pharisees and the guards and and. And of course, you know, Peter cut some guys here off in, in that moment. But then, once they take Jesus away, he, he's asked three different times by three different people whether or not he's affiliated with Jesus. Aren't you that man with Christ? No, 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 no. Don't you walk with the Messiah? No, 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 no. Don't you know Jesus? No, 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 no. Three times, Peter denied Christ. And he was heartbroken. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes, sometimes it, it takes us failing to know that we're really not with Christ. Sometimes hardships will really define our relationship with Jesus. And sometimes we need, uh, we need to fall. Sometimes we need those hardships to, to open our eyes to see whether or not we are really united with Christ. You know you are when, um, how close you are to Jesus when hard things happen, right? Because 
you know, you go into flight mode or, 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 or fight mode. Either you're going to fight to be close to Jesus, to be united with him, or you're going to run away. And Peter, you know, he said, Jesus, I would never, I would never uh, deny you, but he did. In that moment, he, he flew away. He ran. Yeah, he ran. So we have to get rid of our pride. We have to get rid of the thinking that we can do all these things on our own. That we have the strength to do everything that we don't. We have to get rid of to Jesus and say, God, like I need you now more than ever. God, I want to put my face down before you and give you my strength because I can't do this without you. And this kind of reminds me of a story um, just recently uh, where I kind of found myself like in this position. It wasn't my fault. It was like, I'll tell you what happened. So a few weeks ago, um, it was actually last week, I was with, uh, I was at the Kyle building, uh, it's, a, it's a coffee shop in the, in the new Kyle building at UCA. And it's really nice. It's like really, really, really nice. And we're getting coffee, and I'm with some of the other directors of the other universities, Tech and Euler and uh, Conway. And there are students all over, there are students in this place, it's packed right now. And this, and this guy named Cody, one of the directors, he's telling us a story about how God had just revealed to him that, that, he doesn't like to, that he doesn't like to give up control. That he's kind of a control freak. And he told us because um, they kind of do house church at Euler, um, but Cody gives everyone the message to preach for, every, for each service. So he kind of has that control of like, what people are going to say, what people are going to teach. And then he's telling us that that night God kind of revealed that to him, but then the next day he had a group and he let a guy in his deacon bleed. And by the end of it, he was really upset because uh, because the guy in his deacon bleed didn't ask him any questions. He didn't he didn't confide like, hey Cody, what do you think? You know, you're the real leader. Like, what do you what do you think? He didn't ask him that. So Cody was really <laughs> upset about that. He was telling me, he's like, man, like I want to talk, you wouldn't let me talk. You know, and Cody would not be telling him, telling him yes, I promise. Um, and, and he's like, I just had to go talk to the Lord about it because I was really upset. And he said, the next day after that day, I went and, and I had a one-on-one -on -one with the guy who was one of my interns. I told him what happened, but I didn't want to tell him because I didn't want him to know that I was, that I had it in my heart. I didn't want him to know that I was, I wanted control, I like giving, giving him control, I like having my voice to be heard, you know? And he tells this guy this story, and, and, and the guy's like, Cody, I think the Spirit of God wants me to tell you something. I just heard something from the Spirit. And Cody's like, he told him that, man, I need to buckle up this guy. Here's some God so well. And so, and Cody says, well, what did he say to you? And this intern said, I think the Lord is telling you, he's telling me to tell you that you, that you need to put your face to the ground. Cody's like, Cody's like, wait, what? It's like, you need to put your face to the ground. And Cody's like, Processing it. It's, it's pretty simple. Put your face to the ground. Put your face to the ground. And um, goes like, okay. And he just needs to like pray about it in the, in the chair in his left. So he's telling us this story. And Matt Carpenter, who is like, he's an obedient man. He's a very obedient man, very quickly. He's, and in the middle of the story, he says, Cody, well, have you put your face to the ground yet? And Cody's like, I mean, I've been processing it, you know, I've been processing. He's like, Cody. Have you put your face to the ground? And then Cody's face turns beat red. He just looks like me. I'm like, I'm not a part of this, man. This isn't my thing. <laughs> That's even more, bro. And he's like, no, I haven't. I'm processing it. And, um, and Matt says, Cody, I think you need to put your face to the ground. I think you need to like, submit yourself and put your face to the ground. That's what God's telling you to do. And Matt says, Cody's just like shaking his head, smiling, very nervous. And, and Matt says, I'll do it with you. He's like, I'm like, what's about to happen? So Matt gets up again, he's like, on his knees and lays face down like a plank, like on the ground. And then Cody gets Cody looks at me, I'm like Cody, and Cody gets up. <laughs> and then Pierce gets up and Michael Richardson gets up and they all lay down. I'm the last one. Like, I'm looking at them like, I gotta do this. And so we, all five of us, are like laid like face down on the ground in front of everyone in this building. And I, people were looking, because I, I was about to now, so I got a chance to see, you know, everyone's reaction. <laughs> they land there, and I'm like, my face is in this concrete. And, but what would happen after that was so incredible. Like, 
the next moment, Cody's weeping and Matt is weeping. And they're all praying and they're all praying to God and asking for forgiveness and saying, God, help us to understand that we don't know we're not in control. We submit to you. We give full lordship to you, to you, Jesus. That's what we all need to do. Unity with Christ begins with submitting completely to him, giving up control, giving power to him, letting go of our, of our rights and giving them to him. That's the first thing we need to do. Once we do that, we can't we can, we can be united. And if you're not doing that in your life, then you're being, actually being divisive. That may be hard to hear, but if you're not giving, giving up control of your life to Jesus, then you are being divisive to the body. So I challenge you the first one, give up control. Put down your pride, pick up your humility, and put your face to the ground. Submit to Jesus. The second thing, the second thing that we need to do to be united with Christ so that the body can be united together is to have sheep ears. <laughs> Say that always makes me laugh. Sheep ears. And um, what I mean about that is because that we, we have to put, put down lies and pick up truth. I don't know if you know this, but there are 2.5 trillion new, um, gosh, I'm forgetting it, new, bit, new bites of information put out every day. Every day. I can't see what that is. That's like, I can't read all of it now, but that's like too many zeros. I don't want to look at it. That's a lot of information. <laughs> And so what I'm trying to say is that like there's so much information out there that, that a lot of us can get lost very, very, very easily. And I feel like that's, that's a, lot, a lot of that happened when earlier in, in, in the year, um, with everything that's been going on, and then people are posting this thing, posting that idea, posting this, posting this opinion, and there's this music, and there's this person, and all that person. And, and a lot of people didn't know what to do, where to go, what to think. I mean, I, I know that I've been in that, in that way a little bit of like, God, what do I do? Where do I go? How do I do this, you know? I have to put, have to put down the lies um, and pick up the truth. But how do we do that? Um, well, one Jesus says, in 17, he says, Sanctify them by the truth, and your word is truth. Your word is truth. Um, we have to start getting in the word. We have to start listening to Jesus. And when I say sheep ears, I'm referring to, to John 10. Um, and in John 10, that's, that's the passage where that's the passage where Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. And that his sheep hear his voice. He says, the one who enters on the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they would, ne but they would never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they will, they, because they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. We have to listen to Jesus way more than us than other other things. I, I think that's so much harder than today's generation, today's time, because there's a plethora of information, this overload of opportunity to hear other voices. You know, like, I mean, people, I, mean, I, know, for, I know people who get their political opinions from TikTok. I mean, that's probably the worst place to get opinions on anything. It's like TikTok, you know, Instagram, you know, all these different places. Like, people are confused because they don't, they're not finding the truth, they're not going to the truth. They're looking, they're listening to other people. And, and Jesus has like this profound like, you know, talk about this. Um, you know, when he, he says, to, he asks the disciples at one point, he says, who do people say I am? And he asks them, who do people say I am? And then the disciples answer say, some say that you are Elijah. Some say that you are Elijah. I'm oh, sorry, I said that. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you are Jeremiah. Some say that you are the prophet. Some say this. Some say that. And he asks, but who do you say? And Peter replies, you are Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And a lot of us are kind of like, 
those people who are, who are listening to everyone but Jesus, who are calling Jesus Elijah and Jeremiah the prophet, you know, but he's not, he's the Messiah, he's the king. So we have to, first and foremost, like, put down um, outside sources that don't give us truth. And I know it can, I know it can be kind of hard because there are a lot of people out there who claim to, like, to really love God and claim to really um, hear, from his, hear from the Lord. And there are a lot of preachers out there and prophets and whoever. And the question is that a lot of us have is, like, how do we differentiate, differentiate who's telling the truth? How do we know, like, who's actually telling us what's real and what's wrong? I have a friend who said this, who said this, her name is Eli Lebron. She said, if you will just try to scale what people are saying and scale their lives to, to the fruits of the Spirit, you can kind of tell who's really listening to God and who's not. And Galatians talks about the fruits, the fruits of the Spirit, which is um, love, gentleness, joy, kindness, forbearance, long suffering. I think Galatians 5, if someone is speaking and they have those fruits within their speech and have those fruits within their life, and there's a good chance that they're, that they're actually, listening, actually listening to Jesus. They're actually following his word. They actually want you to, to follow real truth. But yeah, we have to we have, to have sheep, sheep's ears. We have to listen to the shepherd. Because if we don't listen to the shepherd, we will walk astray. So when Jesus asks, or when someone else is asking, you know, like, where's God at? Like, who is God? Where's Jesus? Does he love me? Or, take him to the word of God. Or, take him to take him the scripture. Take him to the truth. Because he says exactly who he is in this book. He says that he is truth. And he makes promises that he keeps. So one, we have to give up control. And two, we have to have sheep here to listen to the shepherd. The third thing, which I think is probably one of the hardest things for us, um, we have to love with grace. I know in my life that's been kind of hard. Um, I find it hard to, to love people that that kind of become enemies to us, you know, to me. Um, really, I, my prayer is that I don't, I don't have enemies. You know, I don't want it. I don't want enemies, I don't want people that I don't like, I don't want people that I'm mad at or don't get to talk to me anymore. Um, but so much of that has happened this year, it's been, it's been tough. And, I, and, I, and, I've, had, and I've had to, to really unify with Jesus in my heart to, to love them well and to treat them with respect. So when we love with grace, we're choosing to put down the fence and choosing to pick up compassion instead. You know, we, I don't think there's been a more offensive time in history than like this time here, recently. You can say anything, and someone's gonna be offended. You're like, you're, like, you're, you're 6'5? I'm 5'11. You think you're better than me because you're 6'5? You know, like, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm being really trivial, but like, it, it's coming to, to stuff like that, you know. One little disagreement, people want to cancel you. There's this, there's this there's that new term, you know, cancel culture. You know, someone doesn't agree with you. Someone messed up. Despite their history, knowing, say, say you know them for years, or have been friends with them for years, they say one thing wrong, and they won't wake up, and then they're done. People are cutting each other out like crazy. And it's sad, because I don't think that I'll be the heart of Jesus. Jesus would want us to forgive. And that's, that's, that, this is the other part of, of, of us that, that we need to, to be united with Jesus so that so, so we can be united with the body. We have to love with grace. We have to put down the fence and so we have to take compassion. We have to start caring because Jesus definitely cared. And I know it can be really hard to care for people when, when, when you're angry. It can be hard to care for people when, when people tell you not to care for them, you know, but we have to more than anyone else, Christians, we have to have compassion. Um, Jesus had compassion. He saw the crowd of people, and he had any words that he had compassion on them, and he fed 5,000 people out of compassion of one moment. Can you imagine how much better this world would be if we all had compassion for each other like that? If we would walk around and just look for someone to bless, look for someone to, to serve, look for someone to, to, to give life to, to share hope to, this world would be incredible. 
But it starts with us first, you know? It starts with us like asking God, like, Lord, give me more compassion. Like, help me not to be offended. Help me not, um, yeah, help me not to, to, to be offended by things that don't really matter. So we have to get hungry for, for those things. If we, if we don't hunger, if we don't thirst for Jesus, if we don't hunger and thirst for, for his compassion, then we will perish. The world will perish with us. It's kind of similar to what happened in that movie, um, Remember the Titans. Those guys had a choice. They had a choice uh, to keep being offended by each other's skin color, to be offended by this other guy from the middle of the whatever. If they chose to be offended, it, it would have been a disaster. There would be no Remember the Titans. It would be for the Titans, you know? It wouldn't be <laughs> for real. <laughs> Like, this never happens. Just forget this never happened, you know? And um, so, like, we have to. We have to choose every day of our lives, every fiber of our being, to have compassion rather than offense. If you look at Jesus, I don't think Jesus lived with offense. Jesus, he lived with um, a big heart, a forgiving heart, a heart of grace. So we have to have the same thing. We have to be one to be compassionate, not to just people we love, but people that we don't seem to like, people who are we seem to be our enemies. We have to wash their feet. We have to be able to wash dirty feet. There are some people who we love, like Caleb, you know, I won't wash his feet. <laughs> he asked me to. But there are people in my life who have been mean to me, and they ask me to do anything. I'd be like, I would think. But that has to change if we respect the world, respect ourselves to be united with Jesus. And if we want the world to be united, to be the united, the body of Christ being united, we have to be willing to wash feet. Jesus washed feet. And, and, and back in his time and context, he, it's not something you did, you just washed folks' feet. You still don't do it now, but even more so then, like that was not a thing because they didn't have, they didn't have like, shoes like these, they didn't have boots, they didn't have covered shoes, and wore sandals and like walked around barefoot, like hobbits, you know? <laughs> so, so just dirty feet, dirty feet, and it's kind of, it's kind of like a humiliating thing to have to like touch someone's feet then, you know? If anyone was sick with any some type of like disease, like you touched them, you are considered unclean. Even if, you, if, if, even if you didn't have that particular disease, you're considered unclean. You have to do some ceremonial wash to even go out in public again and touch other people. That's how serious it was then. But Jesus, he looked beyond that. He knew that the way to unite the people was to serve them. And a lot of times it's hard to want to serve people when we don't feel taken care of. You know what I mean? Like, we, like when you're like in, a, in a state of just like a pain or you lose someone or whatever in your life, like you want to you want to cry, you know what I mean? That's what kind of you want to you want to kind of like be reserved and stick to yourself. But one of the one of the coolest things Matt Carvin told me was this. He said, he said when you don't feel taken care of, look to take care of others. That's what Jesus did. He took care of others, and we have to do the same thing. We have to be able to wash people's feet, even when we're in pain. You know, Jesus was willing to to carry the cross and die for all of us. You know, despite like, being spat on, talked about, beaten, maimed, cut, you know, beat down, whatever. All those things happened to Jesus, and He walked with love and He walked with grace. If He didn't have love, if He didn't have grace. Jesus would not have sacrificed his life for any of us. That's what it takes. To walk with compassion, to walk without offense, we have to have love, we have to have grace. So we have to ask God for those things. We have to ask God for all those things. Um, so we need to give up control, we have to have sheep ears, and the love of grace. I think it's important. Uh, if you really want those in your life, then you, have to, then you need to pray for them. Like for real. It kind of starts there a little bit too. You have to pray for those things. Jesus prayed. He prayed this long prayer. What makes us think we don't have to pray? We need to be praying. If you really want to see, start seeking transformation with these three different things in our lives, we have to pray for them. We have to ask God, will you help me give up control? God, will you help me listen to you and listen to you wherever I shut out the outside voices that aren't giving me truth? God, will you help me love with grace? Because I don't want to give this person grace. 
they've, they've lied to me, they've hurt me, they've belittled me. Will you give me the strength to have the grace the way you had it? The same grace, Jesus, that carried you to the cross despite being tortured. You give me that same grace. And I believe that if we ask for those things, I believe that God will give us those things. Because those things align with his heart. Those things are unified with his heart. Make sense? So if we choose, if you're choosing to want to unify the body, this body, your body, the body that's here to stay kind of awful, you first have to unify with Jesus. You have to. Absolutely have to unify with Jesus. Yeah. So, just a little, 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 little not necessarily an altar call, but kind of a call. I believe that everyone of you in here who's here tonight like, are here for a reason. Um, I believe that every one of you who is here tonight, you are here because you want to know about more, know more about God, you want to know more about Jesus, you want to know how to be more like Him. Um, and these three things I was just describing, these three points I just gave you, all those things. And, and, and I know from my life, I'm not doing all these things perfectly all the time, but I'm, I'm definitely trying to. I'm definitely, I'm definitely trying to, to submit to Jesus and not have my hands in everything, you know. I try to control my life all the time. Um, but I want to do that. So I just want to ask a few questions to you guys. 